Now, children, to bed, to bed. The Sandman is coming, I can see. And certainly, on all these occasions, I heard something with a heavy, slow step go bouncing up the stairs that I thought must be the Sandman. Once that dull noise and footstep were particularly fearful, and I asked my mother while she took us away, Eh, hey, Mama, who is this naughty Sandman? Who always drives us away from Papa? What does he look like? There is no Sandman, dear child, replied my mother. When I say the Sandman comes, I only mean that you are sleepy and cannot keep your eyes open, just as if sand had been sprinkled into them. For Hoffman, this is actually, yeah, the, 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 the Sandman is kind of a... I, I discovered it when I was in cinema school, and, I, and actually... Oh, wow. The first time we had, like, this benevolent figure of the Sandman become um, a boogeyman. Apparently, it's one of the first stories transforming this figure into basically a monster. Oh. Eyes... I, I remember the, um, because I've read it in, in French, but uh, the, the Sandman, like, you know, it says that it's the, the friend of his father who is the Sandman. And he does a weird pronunciation because he takes eyes of children. Mm. And in French, he say, des you, des you, instead of saying des you, he said, des you, des you. Aïs, mm. aïs. <laughs> Full of curiosity to hear more of this Sandman and his particular connection with children, I at last asked the old woman who tended my youngest sister what sort of man he was. Eh, hey, Natty, said she, do you not know that yet? He is a wicked man who comes to children when they will not go to bed and throws a handful of sand into their eyes, so they start out bleeding from their heads. These eyes he puts in a bag and carries them to the half-moon to feed his own children who sit in the nest up yonder and have crooked beaks like owls with which they may pick up the eyes of the naughty human children. I didn't know much about Hoffman, and the only adaptation I know from him are the opera, like, about his stories. I sort of grew up with that opera. It was one of my, my requested birthday presents. I had a, had a recording of the, of the opera. I just loved the whole variety of it wow. and it, it took me a while to understand that Hoffman in the opera was a real life Hoffman off stage and that this was yeah. actually yeah that was that was sort of him describing it, it is it sort of semi-autobiographical Hoffman wrote two novels and over 50 stories before his death in 1822, combining the fantastic and the sinister with human psychology. His influence is far-reaching and includes stage, ballet, opera and film. The opera The Tales of Hoffman by Jacques Offenbach was based on three of Hoffman's stories. The Sandman, The Cremona Violin and The Story of the Lost Reflection. This last story is inspired by Hoffman's real-life love for his music student, Julia Mark, although the Cremona violin also shares similar elements. Olympia, for example. Yeah, she's supposed to be the daughter of a mysterious man called Dr. Coppelius, I think. Like that. One day, Sigismund said to him, Be kind enough, brother, to tell me how it was possible for a sensible fellow like you to fall in love with that wax face, that wooden doll up there. Nathaniel was about to fly out in a passion, but he quickly recollected himself and retorted. Tell me, Sigismund, how is it that Olympia's heavenly charms could escape your glance, which generally perceives everything so clearly, your active senses, but for that very reason, heaven be thanked, I have not you for my rival, otherwise one of us must have fallen a bleeding corpse. Sigismund plainly perceived his friend's condition, and so he skillfully gave the conversation a turn and added, after observing that in love affairs there was no disputing about the object, Nevertheless, it is strange that many of us think much the same about Olympia. To us, pray do not take it ill, brother, she appears singularly stiff and soulless. Her shape is symmetrical, so is her face, that is true. She might pass for beautiful if her glance were not so utterly without a ray of light, without the power of seeing. Then you've got Coppelia, the ballet, 
by Deline, mm -hmm. and that's another one that's derived from the Sandman, from the same story. Ah, huh, true. The ballet, that has a happy ending. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> The Ballet Coppelia by Leo de Libes premiered in Paris in 1870 and was an immediate success. The ballet was devised as a comedy, and while the idea of a doll being brought to life persists in the story, the young hero is saved from losing his soul and his mind by his sweetheart. On an eerie footnote, Coppelia was performed at its premiere by the 16-year-old Giuseppina Bozzacchi, who tragically died only a year later during the siege of Paris. And did you see the article by Paolo Mazzarello? Uh, uh, he makes the connection. No, I haven't. <coughs> so Paolo Mazzarello. Mazzarello's suggestion is that this scientist, this priest scientist, was a prototype of the later diabolical character, Spallanzani, in the short story. So this was one of these scientist priests his name was Lazzaro Spallanzani, with two L's. Spallanzani. Yeah, so if you notice in the short story, The Sandman by Hoffman, it's Spallanzani with one L. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. It's kind of, kind of interesting, yeah. In an article in the journal Nature in 2001, the Italian researcher Paolo Mazzarello points out that the real Spallanzani professor of natural history at Pavia University in the late 18th century and a member of Britain's Royal Society, reported that he had obtained resurrection after death by adding water to tiny dehydrated animals. The scientist priest became disturbed by the metaphysical implications of what he had done and wrote to Voltaire asking what he thought happened to the animal's souls while they were dead. When a man like you announces that he has brought the dead back to life, we have to believe him. If there is someone, sir, that has the right to explain this mystery, this person is you. Spallanzani, who died in 1799, cut the heads of snails to see whether they would grow back, discovered that blinded bats could still find their way in the dark, showed that natural chemicals inside the body digested food, and was the first to observe white blood cells. <laughs> it seem uh, like an inspiration for... Hoffman Sandman. Well, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> and the interesting thing is, I find with this character, the the real Lazzaro Spallanzani, he goes and he goes and contacts Voltaire, and and asks him, oh, well, what what do you think I should do? I'm I'm not very comfortable about this, <laughs> you know. And Voltaire sort of looks at him and says, well, if you don't know, mate, I can't tell you. you know? <laughs> 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 He's also a very good prototype for Frankenstein, isn't he? Because it's, he's questioning himself at the same time. Oh, should I be doing this? Yeah. At the same time, he goes on doing it. <laughs> do it, do it. Oh. And, it's, and it's, it is essentially you have, so you've got the, the real life scientist priest resurrecting tiny dehydrated beings, animals, and bringing them back to life with some water. And then you have the Sandman, where you have another crazy scientist called Dr. Spallanzani, with one L, who builds this beautiful female doll, which drives a young man insane. And then, if you think about the Frankenstein connection... It was on a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me, that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. It was already one in the morning, the rain pattered dismally against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out, when, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. The Sandman was written when? Uh, hmm. The Sandman. Hang on. It was published in 1817. As late as that? Apparently so. Nachtstucker? Oh, yeah, night pieces. 
So it wasn't published before then? So, oh, and then, okay. 1816, sorry. <clears throat> ah, that's that makes a bit more sense. And then we have Mary Shelley. She goes to Italy. They go to the villa to visit Lord Byron. And when does she write Frankenstein? Uh, so Frankenstein would be... 1818. So yeah. it's a year or two years after the Sandman. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe, or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I had endeavoured to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful. Beautiful? Great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of a lustrous black, and flowing his teeth of a pearly whiteness. But these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes, that seemed almost of the same colour as the dun-white sockets in which they were set, his shrivelled complexion and straight black lips. And we know Mary Shelley was aware of uh, galvanism. Uh, we know her interest in it. Mm -hmm. that they would discuss such questions as resurrection, electricity, life, source of life, as well as ghost stories and alchemy, occultism and galvanism. You had quite a lot of interesting brains converging at the Vida Diodata. You had Byron, Percy Bysshe Shelley, John Polidori and Mary. So that's, that's quite a mixture. And you can imagine them sitting into the long hours of the night while the storm rages outside and trying to frighten each other to death with silly ghost stories. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it seems possible, and I think this is the other thing that was pointed out in this article, that this Spallanzani could have inspired Hoffman and either directly Mary Shelley or she Mary Shelley through Hoffman. Okay. Because of the sequence, because of the timeline. Hmm. You have the Sandman pops out at around, what, 1816, 1817. Frankenstein comes out a year later. Yeah. Do you um, think she would have read it, perhaps? It's possible. The timing, it could make perfect sense. So yeah. she's either read it or perhaps she's heard of Spallanzani's experiments. She certainly knows about galvanism, for instance. So, you know, this would just yeah. be another subtopic. Oh, by the way, the other day I read this paper about... <laughs> By the way, there was someone who was creating a human being with a doll, you know, like... Yes, yes. The eyes of human beings and all that. <laughs> I was unable to remain for a single instant in the same place. I jumped over the chairs, clapped my hands, and laughed aloud. Clerval at first attributed my unusual spirits to joy on his arrival, but when he observed me more attentively... He saw a wildness in my eyes for which he could not account, and my loud, unrestrained, heartless laughter frightened and astonished him. "'My dear Victor,' cried he, "'what, for God's sake, is the matter? Do not laugh in that manner. How ill you are! What is the cause of all this?' "'Do not ask me,' cried I, putting my hands before my eyes, for I thought I saw the dreaded spectre glide into my room. He can tell. Oh, save me, save me!' I imagined that the monster seized me. I struggled furiously and fell down in a fit. Poor Clerval, what must have been his feelings? A meeting which he anticipated with such joy so strangely turned to bitterness. But I was not the witness of his grief, for I was lifeless and did not recover my senses for a long, long time. Both Hoffman and Shelley explore madness. They both explore the obsessive creation of a man-made being, and the concept of a relentless nemesis. Both Olympia and the creature are hybrids and reflect humanity's fear of losing control in the face of steadily encroaching science and technology. This fear of the uncanny, as termed by Sigmund Freud and others, has persisted into the present day, culminating in the uncanny valley effect, researched by roboticist Masahiro Mori in the 1970s, where human instinct is to fear and doubt human-like androids. But it's strange that they didn't try to make a modern version, even in film, of The Sandman, because it could be actually a great thriller horror about madness, illusions, 
Totally. Because well, I guess the nearest thing you could say is some of the AI films, the sci-fi films that have been made. For instance, Ex Machina. Oh, perhaps Ex Machina. He wins a, an office contest. And the guest of the CEO of the company who reveals that he's built this humanoid robot called Ava with artificial intelligence. This contest winner, he wants this guy to judge whether Ava is genuinely capable of thought and consciousness. And it turns into a horror thriller. Very much derived, I would say, from Hoffman uh, stories. And Frankenstein. Ex Machina premiered in 2014 and comparison has been made with the story of Frankenstein. The roboticist, like Frankenstein, creates a being, but unlike Frankenstein, it is the programmer, not the roboticist, or creator, who is emotionally affected and becomes a central figure in the story. Curiously, the roboticist's name is Nathan, whereas in Hoffman's Sandman, the hero victim is called Nathaniel. In both stories, there is dancing and madness. In Ex Machina, Nathan grows increasingly unstable in his behaviour. Caleb, the programmer, meanwhile grows increasingly attached to Ava, the humanoid robot. Are Caleb and Nathan the two halves of the Nathaniel character in The Sandman? There was also, well, a, I'm, I'm going to um, drop to video games like references. I'm not talking about games that are very popular, more like independent video games. So there is two franchises that are really well of horror. And basically there is one which is called um, Bendy and the Ink Machine. Ooh. So basically it's the story, you know, you, you play a cartoon artist who has been pulled by his friend and former employer to their workshop to see why he's been working on. And they both are creator of a little demons, you know, but in the old uh, Disney style, like it's supposed to be set in the the late uh, 30s. Oh, wow. Uh, the guy basically tried to give life to the cartoon characters. And there is a lot of theories like it might have used the souls of employees who were working at the studio. So you have these horrific uh, twisted version of the characters uh, coming Ooh. to life and attacking you. Scary. And there is another game which takes actually the same uh, direction, which is called Puppy Playtime. And uh, the story is you are an ancient employee who worked there to a, a toy factory, a famous toy factory. And you are being chased by giant version of the toys you've worked with who wants to eat you. <coughs> so you have... Uh, like a monstrous furry guy with a huge chief called Huggy Wuggy who wants to eat you. Huggy yeah. Wuggy. Yeah. Huggy. It's a very, very weird game. Yeah, I know. It's kind it's of scary. Morbid and twi twisted, but yeah, it joins the principle of. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm so surprised, you know. It's one of the most famous short stories of Hoffman. And yet, it never has been adapted into a film or inspired, you know, for a, a thriller film, for example, or a horror one. Uh, Both. It is so gothic, isn't it? Because you've got the whole business with the eyes at the beginning is, is quite horrific. Eyes! And... Eyes! Eyes! <laughs> Lothair ran down with his fainting sister in his arms. She was saved. Nathaniel went raging about the gallery and bounded high in the air, crying, Fire circle, turn thyself, turn thyself! The people collected at the sound of the wild shriek, and among them, prominent by his gigantic stature, was the advocate, Corpelius, who had just come to the town and was proceeding straight to the marketplace. Some wished to ascend and secure the madman, but Coppelius laughed, saying, Ha ah, ah, ha, early wait, he will soon come down of his own accord, and looked up like the rest. Nathaniel suddenly stood still, as if petrified. He stooped down, perceived Coppelius, and, yelling out, Ah, 
pretty eyes, pretty eyes. He sprang over the railing. When Nathaniel lay on the stone pavement with his head shattered, Coppelius had disappeared in the crowd. But you know, I was there was a moment I was thinking about doing a, an adaptation of The Sandman into a film, but it's going to be really hard to do. It would make a, it would make a very good horror thriller. Would you do it as costume? Would you do it like set in the period, the 18, 1812, 1800s? Not necessarily, but now I lost my inspiration. And it's a, when I had the inspiration, I was in cinema school at the time. But even as a play, it could be great, actually. Yes. Yeah. Do it as an audio drama, podcast. Yeah. Do a special. Hour and a half, because I think it's it's quite it's got it's got it's a lot of it too, and it's complex. It has you know a lot of layers. So it starts with the eyes, then you get the main.